In the first edition of Charles Darwin's landmark book on the origin of species, his only mention of humans is confined to a single sentence on page 488, just before the end of the book. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Who would have thought that over 160 years later, so much light would be thrown to make us almost blind in some cases? For the next half hour, I'm going to give you the lowdown on the broad sweep of human evolution, from the earliest primates to Homo sapiens, summarizing our biological and cultural history. Let's jump in. After the Great Bolide struck the Earth around 66 million years ago, ending the Mesozoic Era and ushering in the Cenozoic Era, a great diversification of mammals took place. One of these groups, the primates, was distinguished by a number of key features close-set, forward-facing eyes, a large expanded brain in relation to body size, an elongated heel bone or calcaneus, and grasping feet with a divergent hallux. The oldest known fossils of primates date to 56 million years ago, using this combination of features as adaptations towards an arboreal existence. Equally important, primates are social mammals, living, learning, and loving with other members of their kind. Being case-selected animals with a prolonged childhood, primates are able to spend a great amount of time growing accustomed to these life ways. From the earliest times, primates have diversified into many forms, with the wet-nosed and dry-nosed primates constituting the first major split, followed by the tarsiers and their kin, and the monkeys, or anthropoids. There were many lineages of monkeys, of which apes are just one. This group, technically called hominoidea, is not just characterized by the lack of a tail, their limbs are much more flexible at the joints, allowing for brachiation through the trees. Between 20 and 13 million years ago, apes flourished across the tropical and subtropical forests of Africa and Eurasia. But the good times would eventually come to a close, and most of these species died out by 10 million years ago following a cooling of the climate. The African apes, wherever they originally came from, are where we belong, sharing a common ancestor with gorillas around 12 million years ago, and splitting off from our closest living relatives, the chimps, around 9 million years ago. Our ape lineage is called hominini, so we're hominins. While a key feature of our clade is reduced canine teeth, which is likely part of a significant reduction in sexual dimorphism, the most obvious feature distinguishing us from the other apes is our obligate bipedalism. These are the traits that show up first in human evolution. But there's still discourse about the nature of the first bipeds and why our ancestors stood up. The sites where the earliest known hominin fossils have been found are mostly open woodland, and the combination of anatomical features for both terrestrial bipedalism and arboreal climbing suggests that these ancestors of ours may have been living in two worlds with a mosaic pattern of locomotion. The best known of these species is Ardipithecus rhombatus, who lived in Ethiopia between 4.5 and 4.3 million years ago. Bipedalism in this species must have been awkward, as the feet show both a wide heel for shock absorption and shortened foretoes for support on flat surfaces, as well as a rigid elongated hallux that could grasp branches. The pelvis would have been bowl-shaped, like in humans today, but the arms were very long, like a chimpanzee. It's thanks to fossils like Artie, we can be fairly confident that the earliest hominins were nothing like living apes or humans. Around three and a half million years ago, there was a great radiation of hominin species in the fossil record, the Australopithecines. The climate was still cooling during this time, and many of these species experimented with different forms of bipedal locomotion across the open woodlands as well as out in the savannas. We know from trackway sites like those at Lake Tole in Tanzania that the foot anatomy was becoming better adapted for bipedalism, with all the toes being in line for better support on the ground. Some species were still at home in the trees, however, and the full transition to a terrestrial lifestyle in our ancestors wouldn't take place for another million years or so. Still, the changes in the overall anatomy were becoming very apparent as the Australopithecines spent more and more time out in the open. Our ancestors lost their thick furry coats by 3.3 million years ago, but were not naked apes, and several gene variants for both dark and light skin pigmentation would emerge within that time, in response to the various latitudes they found themselves in. These new adaptations would have affected Australopithecines in many ways, especially how they raised their children. Without fur to cling on to, infant care might have begun to be shared among the group during foraging trips. 
Speaking of foraging, up until this time, early hominins were probably no more omnivorous than our closest relatives, but suspicious cut marks on animal bones around 3.3 million years ago have led to suggestions that Australopithecines may have already been hunting and or scavenging meat, fat, and other animal flesh around this time. Simultaneously, the Loequian industry, the earliest of its kind, was in use in Kenya, kickstarting the Paleolithic, or Old Stone Age. While it's possible that hominins were using these tools for cutting into carcasses, they may just have easily have been multi-purpose, to dig up underground storage organs, for example. As time went on, Australopithecines continued to diversify into ever more forms. The robust Paranthropus was a grazer, the hominin equivalent of a horse. But by 2.7 million years ago, there was a new kid on the block, the genus Homo. On the surface, there isn't much to distinguish Homo from the Australopithecines. At most, our cheek teeth have shrunk in size, but it's with our genus that hominin cranial capacity begins to grow, going from a chimp like 350 to 600 cc's in Australopithecines to 600 to 800 cc's in early Homo, with a larger prefrontal cortex. This is a sign that social intelligence increased during this time. The poster child of this great of evolution is Homo habilis, who lived between 2.3 and 1.6 million years ago in Tanzania, within an ever-changing landscape. Hominins of this sort are often associated with the Oldowan industry, an assemblage of stone scrapers and choppers for acquiring plant and animal food, which took more time and practice to create, suggesting an understanding of basic physics. And individuals even sought out specific rock types in order to create them. The process of learning to make Oldowan tools likely contributed to our evolution. It has been demonstrated that the parts of the brain that light up during the creation or even observation of stone chipping are associated with learning, planning, and communication. The consistency in the tool types across thousands of years points to a revolution in animal intelligence, collective learning. Rather than knowledge dying out with an individual, it can last for generations, changing and expanding over time as other individuals contribute what they've learned. Much of what makes human creativity so powerful is thanks to this ability. And we took it far. Phylogenetic evidence suggests that some members of the genus Homo expanded their populations out of Africa and into the equally great continent of Eurasia, where the earliest known fossils date to 1.8 million years ago in Dominici, Georgia. And similar stone industries to the old Iwan from Jordan and China point to movements as early as two and a half million years ago. Some of their descendants, perhaps, settled in Southeast Asia by 700,000 years ago, giving rise to the diminutive island-living Homo floresiensis, who coexisted with dwarf elephants, Komodo dragons, and giant storks. Back in Africa, around two million years ago, a new hominin evolved, Homo ergaster. It is with this species that the modern human body plan evolved. Thousands of years of carnivory had shrunk the length of the intestines, and our legs had elongated to correspond with now obligate bipedality, allowing us to engage in long-distance endurance running, aided by a more modern foot morphology. And we got taller, too. Though the modern skull is still a ways off, our cranial capacity had broken past the 1000 mark. Our head was now increasing in width, which would cause deadly problems for people in labor. The solution? Midwifing. By assisting with pregnancies, other members of the group decreased the risk for miscarriages and other concerns. Eventually, a sort of unconscious compromise emerged. By keeping brain development unfinished following birth, infants could now pass through the pelvis without serious complications, and this prolonged brain growth meant a prolonged childhood. It's estimated that by the time of Homo ergaster, sexual maturity reached the modern time of 24 years, even more time to become enculturated, more human. A significant change came with the evolution of more dexterous fingers. Now that all of your fingers could make contact with each other, we could turn our hand into a powerful yet sensitive tool. We could make and do more things than our ancestors. Stone toolmaking changed with the creation of the Ashulean industry, including distinct types of choppers and cleavers, and the so-called hand axes, whose use still remains debated, show inklings of almost aesthetic thought in their construction. This is further seen in the expansion of tool technologies, including the first evidence of bone and shell tools, of which one of these shows strange zigzag etchings on its side. Is this art? Hominins, like the relatives of the chimpanzees, must have understood what fire was and how it could be used, but the oldest evidence of fire as a tool comes from the one million year old site of Wonderwork Cave in South Africa, where char marks on animal bones point to cooking behaviors. 
We don't know when cooking your food became a thing, or even how it influenced our evolution, but the physical health benefits are obvious. Hearts may very well have been important for mental health benefits too, providing us a safe place to rest, eat, and tell stories, as they are for modern humans today. Indeed, there's a case to be made that the origins of spoken languages may well have started with hominins like Homo ergaster. A number of key anatomical hardware for using language, like the Broca and Wernicke's areas of the brain, and a low larynx as indicated by the base of the skull, were in place during this time, but the details are still debated. In any case, between 2 to 1 million years ago, humans were now in a position to become a significant influence in their environments, and before long we were making yet more expansion into the Eurasian continent, where the famous Homo erectus would evolve and flourish for many thousands of years in present-day China and Southeast Asia, and Homo antecessor would make a home for itself in Western Europe, the first hominins to do so. 2.58 million years ago marked the beginning of the Quaternary Period and its first epoch, the Pleistocene, the time of the last ice age. For successive periods, the Earth's climate would shift between cool glacial and warm interglacial periods, affecting life on Earth and placing survival pressures on our ancestors. During the middle of the Pleistocene epoch, a great variety of hominins lived throughout Africa and Eurasia. Whether they were descendants of Homo ergaster or a related species, we don't know and paleoanthropologists have complicated matters by giving so many names to these peoples, who all share robust skulls with large brow ridges and strong jaws, that it's difficult to tell who is related to who. Anthropologist Chris Stringer has called this the muddle in the middle. There is no doubt now that, by 400,000 years ago, we find evidence that humans were engaging in increasingly lucrative big game hunts, killing their prey with thick wooden spears, and demonstrating a greater capacity for large scale cooperation between groups. During this time, one lineage emerged out of this muddle in the western part of Eurasia by 430,000 years ago, the famous Neanderthals, of which the classic type emerged 250,000 years ago. Contrary to popular stereotypes, they were just about as human as we were, if not more muscularly built and requiring twice the number of calories an adult person needs today. They were hardy survivors, making a living in a number of different environments and experimenting with a number of technological and aesthetic innovations. Neanderthals may have even been among the first hominins to use mortuary practices, an extension of a deeper understanding of death that goes back a long way. And yes, while they would have used caves as shelters, they were also capable of building open-air structures made of stone and wood. In the eastern reaches of Eurasia, sharing a common ancestry with Neanderthals, are the more mysterious Denisovans, known from very fragmentary remains. The only reason paleoanthropologists were able to distinguish them at all was through the sequencing of their preserved DNA, which has already given us many clues to their life ways. The recently published Harbin skull, named Homo longi, may be a Denisovan or a close relative. It's in Africa by 315,000 years ago that our species emerged, Homo sapiens. Right away, there are sharp distinctions between the skulls of modern humans and those of our ancestors and relatives. Our cranial vault is globular in shape to house a more compact brain with an enlarged cerebellum, essentially sinking our face downwards. Our teeth are smaller in size, but with higher enamel, and we have the first honest to goodness chin. The modern type anatomy of Homo sapiens doesn't appear to have evolved in one single package instead emerging out of a complex ebb and flow of human populations throughout Africa and Southwest Asia, each contributing one key feature or another to give us the anatomically modern human, in place by 233,000 years ago. Even today, the region of the greatest diversity of human genes is in Africa. There's a possibility that our more gracile anatomy, compared with other hominins, was a result of self-domestication, an unconscious artificial selection process where a consistency of human interactions within groups shifted more towards a reinforcement of kindness, trust, and cooperation allowed for the development of more infantile bodily proportions. This tends to happen with domestic animals, even when people aren't selecting for those specific anatomical traits. If you notice, juvenile Neanderthals do look more like adult Homo sapiens than they do adult Neanderthals. This propensity for heightened compassion and cooperation, alongside an equally heightened capacity for violence and distrust, made Homo sapiens a powerful animal on the world stage. Our numbers soon increased, divisions of labor became more widespread, and we were using more and more resources from the environment to aid in the survival and flourishing of our cultures. It's possible to consider Homo sapiens a generalist specialist, 
Our behaviors are so plastic and adaptable that we can enter any type of ecological zone, learn what's there, and develop distinct social behavioral traits for a greater ease of navigating those spaces. And we can pack up, move to a different zone, and repeat the process there. And pack up we certainly did. Beginning in a series of waves over 210,000 years ago that may have reached as far as China, but really picking up steam around 60,000 years ago in northeastern Africa, Homo sapiens expanded its population into Eurasia and beyond, likely a response to the push and pull factors that underpinned climatic changes during that time. Of course, we didn't enter virgin territory, as Neanderthals, Nisabens, and other humans were already living there for thousands of years. Our interactions with them must have varied, with some anthropologists suggesting long periods of cultural exchange between human species, where we taught each other new skills. There are no doubts now that we mated with Neanderthals and other humans. Living people today, outside of Sub-Saharan Africa, share 3% of their genome with Neanderthals, with Sub-Saharan Africans having as much as 0.3%. And living people in Oceania and Greater Eurasia share anywhere between 0.1% and 6% of their genomes with Denisovans. Other studies show similar interbreeding events with unknown hominins in both Africa and Eurasia, so there was a lot of getting busy during the late Pleistocene. For all this exchange, the other species of humans would eventually go extinct, with Homo floresiensis dying out around 50,000 years ago, Neanderthals dying out around 40,000 years ago, and Denise events potentially hanging on until 15,000 years ago. What happened? Well, that's debated, but we most likely outbred and outcompeted them. During this time, Homo sapiens migrated to all of the major land masses on Earth. We reached Australia by 50,000 years ago, Melanesia by 43,000 years ago, and Japan by 38,000 years ago, meaning that we had invented seafaring technology by those times. Europe was settled around 54,000 years ago, and Central Asia was reached as early as 46,000 years ago, where the use of the bone needle for sewing tight-fitting clothing became a key advantage in surviving the cold. And we may also have domesticated the dog while we were there. Extreme Northeast Siberia was reached 44,000 years ago, and we had definitely trickled into the Americas by 23,000 years ago, although evidence suggests other humans made even earlier journeys. In all this time, we still remained a fairly homogenous species both physically and mentally. The great expansion into Eurasia 60,000 years ago was so relatively recent that every person not of immediate sub-Saharan ancestry shares between 91.8 to 98.5% of their DNA. And when you include Sub-Saharan Africans, the number goes to 99.9%. And that 0.1%, I must stress, has nothing to do with so-called racial characters. There is no biological basis for race. By the late glacial maximum between 26 and 19,000 years ago, when the ice sheets were at their widest spread and temperatures plunged into extremes, Homo sapiens was more or less the last human species on Earth, a cosmopolitan success story. The world at the end of the last glacial period, including the thousands of years prior to our current geological epoch, the Holocene, was one of rapid environmental change. Not simply because the global climate was warming, but because there were now effective landscape engineers all over the place. Though the discourse remains frustratingly contentious, it seems that wherever our species went during the time of the great population expansions, many species of megafauna, animals larger than 45 kilograms, decreased their ranges and went extinct. Given the pressures of adapting to yet another interglacial period, further stress was likely placed on these slow-growing, slow-breeding species by human hunting expeditions, which immediately made them vulnerable to extinction. The loss of big game did shift cultural change in new directions, as humans now had to hone their skills in developing technologies towards the procurement of smaller prey species. But we had always been innovators. Humans had developed pottery by 20,000 years ago, the atolotl or spear thrower was in place by 17,000 years ago, and copper metallurgy was used by 10,000 years ago, much of this technology emerging multiple times in different regions. The loss of multi-ton steaks and pork chops didn't seem to be too big a blow to our ancestors. A curious trend was occurring as the Holocene Pact began 1.7 thousand years ago. The number of human cultures was increasing. The shift to ever warmer temperatures following the Ice Age meant that many areas across the continents became lush, fertile places with abundant resources. While sedentism, the act of settling down and staying year-round in a region, was likely nothing new in human history, there seems to have been a rise in the number of sedentary sites in the archaeological record around this time. As these new post-glacial societies rose, they often came into contact with each other, sometimes for trade, sometimes for intermarriage, and sometimes for battle. 
while violent contact between human groups is likely very old, an increase in warfare seems to have started during this time. People began to distinguish themselves from each other in dress, in language, in technology, in beliefs. Not everyone followed this pattern, of course. Many peoples retained lives as wide-ranging foraging bands, while others, living in more northerly reaches, shifted between sedentism and nomadism. And when they got together, they built impressive stone structures that would have required far greater levels of cooperation than had previously been known. Throughout this time, people experimented with new ways of obtaining food. Humans have always been great landscape modifiers, often setting fire to patches of forest to encourage new growth, or building great ditches and dams for collecting fish and shellfish. But sometimes we also took the seeds of the plants we enjoyed eating, and instead of grinding them into bread and beer, planted them in the soil and tended them, often when times were especially tough for foraging. This form of long-term planning, while not necessarily new, would eventually have tremendous consequences for human history. Agriculture emerged independently across the world, starting at least 12,000 years ago, with some estimates suggesting 23 key centers of farming, where important plant and animal species were eventually domesticated to suit the needs of the people using them. The transition to the Neolithic, or New Stone Age, was very gradual, and not at all the revolution it has historically been known. Crops, animals, and farming practices spread far around the planet, often accompanied by the people who pioneered them, but how they would be used subsequently varied. Some societies embraced only a few crops, rejecting the rest, while others took certain animals and centered their entire lives around herding them from place to place, the first pastoralists. It's with the great spread of agriculture that we also see key demographic changes to human cultures. Many of the world's large language families like Bantu, Sino-Tibetan, and Austronesian expanded their ranges across hundreds of kilometers. In fact, the spread of that latter language group essentially completed the global expansion of Homo sapiens, from which the descendants of the Lapita culture, using their outrigger boats, populated the greater Pacific Islands, reaching the last ones by 1350 AD. For those who really took to the agricultural lifestyle, especially in Africa, Southwest Asia, and East Asia, they experienced pronounced changes to their biology. People eventually became better adapted towards the digestion of certain foods, like milk and rice, eventually working through the bitter periods of early agriculture, which shortened average overall height, brought more tooth decay, and introduced new diseases through close contact with livestock. Humans continued to evolve physically during the 11,700 years of the Holocene, and this was especially prominent throughout our cultural evolution. By 9,000 years ago, settlements like Chateau Hoyuk in Anatolia were basically proto-cities, where as many as 8,000 people lived together in biologically unrelated kin groups within mud-brick homes. They were precarious but egalitarian societies, and when the first truly large urban societies emerged along the great river valleys and coasts of the world, they functioned not unlike the large-scale communities of yesteryear, just in condensed form. The greater masses of people meant more opportunities for collaboration and invention, and it's within the first cities where we find the plow and the potter's wheel. Resources were managed communally, and required mutually agreed upon schedules to maintain in accordance to the yearly seasonal cycles. Increasing conflicts between sedentary agriculturalists in lowland regions and nomadic warring pastoralists in the highlands appear to have played a key role in the development of some early cities by 5,000 years ago. The earliest city leaders actually post-date the earliest cities, and it seems that many of them were actually warriors, who took over kingly positions and reinforced their rule over people through associations with other warriors. It didn't always work, and there were times when the greater masses revolted against them to live communal lives. But eventually some managed to incorporate themselves into existing religious systems, granting them the right to rule by divine circumstances. The similarities between the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, the Mandate of Heaven in the Chinese dynasties, and the godlike lords of the classic Maya are more than just coincidence. Temples and government buildings would arise in some of the early cities, where taxes were established to help support the ruling classes and their projects, which could be for benevolent or malevolent purposes, only changing with the introduction of metal coins by 2,600 years ago. Writing emerged first and foremost as a means to record inventories of goods, and the innovations in bronze and then iron metallurgy were originally reserved for the most elite classes. It was only later that these new forms of technology would become disseminated among the lower classes, allowing for a greater expansion in cultural expression, including the first accounts of written history. A lot has changed in the last 5,000 years. 
from the rise of kingdoms and empires to the flowering of philosophy that gave rise to the world's great faiths, from the spread of ideas, technologies, and diseases along larger trade routes to the age of European conquest, when a then relatively obscure corner of the world went on to colonize and reshape the rest of the planet in their image. The Industrial Revolution of the 18th and 19th centuries and the Digital Revolution of the late 20th century only accelerated cultural change. Now it's possible to talk about globalization and its consequences. In just the last 500 years, the pace of environmental impacts by Homo sapiens has skyrocketed to unprecedented levels. Much of the world's agricultural land has been reduced by 33%, deforestation has cut the Earth's forests by many millions of square kilometers, land ice is melting everywhere, the oceans are extremely polluted by microplastics, over half of wild vertebrate populations have been wiped out, and the burning of fossil fuels has pushed the Earth's carbon dioxide levels to around 420 parts per million, at a substantially more rapid rate than the previous declaciations of the last ice age. Clearly, there's a lot to be worried about, and it's understandable to be very upset at the fact that the majority of this environmental devastation is the result of greed, power, and just general ignorance. But to quote anthropologist Augustine Fuentes, our ancestors set the stage for us by living creative and cooperative lives, as individuals and in groups. We can't let that go to waste. These serious issues can be overcome, no matter how difficult they seem, provided we work together to push for the radical changes needed to ensure that our present and future lives are as healthy and fulfilled as can be, and then some. After all, if the story of human evolution has taught us anything, it's that even the tiniest changes in the way we do things can have massive rippling effects through the generations. It's all part of being human. It's what we do. Thank you for watching! This video functions as a standalone episode, but it's also a summary of an earlier 13-part lecture series for Through Time and Clades called Humanity A Prologue. It's been a while since we finished that series, and we've been continuously updating and expanding the material presented, but we're still proud of it, and it's full of great information, so feel free to check it out if you're interested. Take care, everyone.